So we pick up in verse 12. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. This guy, Paul, who's writing is in prison because he's going around telling people that Jesus is Lord and King, not Caesar. Uh, his friends at the church in Philippi, they, they're wanting to support Paul and to find out how he's doing. So they've sent um, this guy called Epaphroditus as their messenger, their representative. He's made the 800 mile or so journey to Rome and he's brought money to buy supplies for Paul. But you can bet he also came with a lot of questions. You know, how are they treating you? How are things going for you really? What's it like? And Paul sends Epaphroditus back with this letter that we're studying together now to the Philippians. And he, in it, he, he says, essentially, thank you for the gift and the gifts over time. Um, but he also says, actually, all that has happened to me has served to advance the gospel. Which raises the question, I think, what has happened to Paul? If we turn back to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, starting at verse 9, we, we find out a little bit of Paul's autobiography. Let me just read that passage for us. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession, like those condemned to die in the arena. We've been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as human beings. We are fools for the king, but you are so wise in the king. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honoured, we are dishonoured. To this very hour we go hungry and thirsty. We're in rags, we're brutally treated, we're homeless. We work hard with our own hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we're persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. We have become the scum of the earth, the garbage of the world, right up to this moment. There's a very similar description of Paul's life and ministry in his second letter to the Corinthians as well. But here's the list. What, what has happened for Paul? Well, he's been condemned to die. He's a fool for Christ, weak, dishonoured, hungry, in rags, brutally treated, homeless, the scum of the earth. Does that sound like an easy life to you? Talk about a hard story. Now back to Philippians chapter 1 and Paul says, All this, what has happened to me, has actually served to advance the gospel. And to top it all off, Paul right now as he's penning those words, or maybe asking Timothy to, um, he's in prison. Bear in mind that the call on Paul's life was to travel the empire declaring the good news of King Jesus. And he is now shut up in a cell. And you'd think that out of all of that, Paul would be saying something like, I'm gutted, that, that for me at least, this has shut down the gospel. I'm out of the game and it is over for me. But instead, he says, actually the opposite is true. All that has served to advance the gospel. That word advance is quite a vivid kind of word picture. You kind of imagine the Roman army kind of out on the march trying to get somewhere and they would have teams of people out ahead of them literally clearing the path. Whether that means bringing down trees, widening the road, smoothing things out, literally cutting a path for the army's advance. That's what Paul says is happening for the gospel. And Paul gives us two examples of that reality. First, in verse 13. As a result, he says, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for the king. That phrase, the palace guard, is praetorium. Uh, the praetorium were a group of about 9,000 soldiers in Rome. They were kind of Caesar's elite bodyguards, if you like. And Paul says that every one of them has come to know what he's in for. You can kind of imagine them on a rotation, hearing bits of Paul's story and getting to work out. They're intrigued by this guy who hasn't committed mass murder, at least not recently. 
Uh, he's not in for insurrection or any of those other things. They're kind of like, what are you in for? And Paul's answer really is, well, you know what? I believe that Jesus is the king of the universe, not Caesar. Your whole empire thing, your whole Caesar is Lord thing, I don't buy it. It's a scam. Kind of imagine him kind of pulling out the, uh, the first draft of this letter that he's kind of working on. I'm actually writing to my friends in Philippi, and you can kind of imagine what would happen if he was to quote that famous bit from, from chapter 2. Therefore God exalted him, that's Jesus, to the highest place, and gave him, that, that's Jesus, the name that is above every name, including Caesar Nero. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, not Caesar Nero. In heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus, the King, is Lord. And the God goes, oh, that's why you're in prison. Because that's treason. If that message is in any way true and it gets out, that spells the end of the empire. It's a dangerous idea for Caesar and his soldiers. You can kind of imagine the talk among those soldiers whispering about this gospel, this good news of a king called Jesus. And the word gets out. Now, the empire's agenda was to shut Paul up. Did that work? No. Everybody knows that he is in chains for this king called Jesus. Second verse uh, 14. Because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. So the second thing that's happened is the brothers and sisters in Rome, the church that is there, have become bolder and more courageous. When they see Paul in prison... They are inspired to preach the gospel as he does. Wait, Paul is, is willing to go to prison for the gospel? Well, maybe I should be doing a bit more. Paul seems willing to, to die for the gospel. Maybe I should be a bit bolder too. And again, the empire's agenda was to make a public example of Paul, to hold him up and say, look what happens to anyone who has the audacity to stand up to Rome. Again, did that work? Not at all. Instead, the believers are made more courageous to go and preach Jesus the King. And so, Paul says, all that has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel of Jesus. And just in case we think it's all kind of straight, uh, straightforward from there, uh, verses 15 to 18 make it clear that it's not. It's not all straightforward. There are some who are preaching Jesus the King out of envy and rivalry, the others out of goodwill. There are some preaching in love, others out of selfish ambition, trying to stir up some kind of trouble for Paul. So the good news is people are preaching the gospel of King Jesus. The bad news, some of those people are preaching the gospel for all the wrong reasons. Maybe, you know, it's my opportunity to shine now that Paul is off the scene. My chance to gain a few followers or plant a church because there's no competition from the super apostle Paul. And you would think that hearing what is going on, that Paul, again, would just be broken and crushed by this news. All these ulterior motives in play while he's shut up in prison and, and out of the game. But no, he says this. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, the king is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. The important thing, what really matters for Paul, is that the king is preached and it's happening. Sure, it's not all ideal. Sure, the people are doing it for all kinds of mixed reasons. But, but because it is happening, I rejoice. And again and again in this letter to Philippians, Paul talks about the joy that he has. Because his joy is linked not to his circumstances, 
but to the advance of the gospel. So what might this mean for us? The the title I gave this morning is The Gospel Advances. I want us to think about, well, what might that mean or look like for us? Because we're not in Paul's situation. We're not sat in a prison cell in Rome 2,000 years ago. That's not our circumstance. But this passage is an example of how God can take evil, if you like, And for Paul, that looks like prison, beatings, persecution, death. For us, that's probably not the kind of evil that we're up against. But but we can think of all kinds of other things. Maybe it's cancer. Maybe it's a parent's divorce or unemployment or whatever it may be. Each of us in different ways bump up against evil. And here we have an example of how God is able to take evil, to break evil into it or to break it apart and to bring something good out of it so that the gospel advances because that's what God does. Now please listen really carefully. I am not saying that evil is somehow part of God's will or part of God's plan. I don't buy that kind of reasoning. What happened to Paul was evil. His imprisonment was evil. I don't believe that Paul being beaten and put in prison was God's will. Those people in Rome who were inspired to preach the gospel but for all the wrong reasons, was that God's will? I don't think so. Those people will be held to account for their motives as well as their actions. But at the same time, God was somehow at work in and through the mess of all of that. When we bump up against evil, we tend to go one of two ways. I've seen both of these happen numerous times. Some people, when evil comes, they get angry at God. They shake their fists at heaven. How could you let this happen? And over time, doubt comes in and Some people then turn away from God and they walk away mad at this God they no longer believe in. That's one route that people sometimes take. The other, though, is is this kind of default to this idea that I don't understand it, I don't like it, it's not nice, but God's in control. I wonder if you've heard people say that. I hear it all the time, or at least versions of it. You may have noticed It's not a phrase I tend to use. But I know a lot of people respond to the problem of evil like this, that it's, it's all part of God's plan. Again, when was the last time I said that? I try not to because I don't, I don't buy it. And yet that is what people say. Again and again, when we're faced with difficult circumstances, it's all part of God's plan. I know there must be a reason for my suffering, and I'm sure there are bits of truth in that. But as a general rule, I don't buy it. My issue with both of these responses, the kind of shaking a fist at heaven or just kind of saying God is in control and it's part of God's plan, is that both of those responses pin the responsibility for evil on God. And yet, if we pause to think a moment, we'll recognize that life is far more complex than that. God is not the only player involved. Sure, there are going to be some times when it is uh, the responsibility is God's, but there's all sorts of other factors in play as well. A friend of mine um, had the opportunity to do their dream job. If they could have sat down and written out exactly what that job would have been. This was it, and they had the opportunity to do it, and it was amazing while it lasted. But that job suddenly no longer existed. They lost that job. And what are we to make of that? Was that that God? Maybe it was God. Maybe that's somehow part of God's plan for my friend's life. Or maybe it was Satan. Maybe that job was such a good thing and had so much potential for God's kingdom that Satan wanted to undermine it and make sure it it was sabotaged. So maybe it was God, maybe it was Satan. 
Maybe, actually, it was a result of sin. Maybe, I think my friend is a really hard worker and really conscientious, but maybe they just sat around reading their Bible all day and didn't do their work. I don't think that's the case. Maybe it was someone else's sin where, you know, actually they, they wanted to get ahead or they didn't like the way things were going and somehow in, in order for that to happen, um, my friend had to go. Who, who knows? Or maybe we just live in a fallen world where the economy is really tough and costs are going through the roof and you just can't sustain all the posts that you would like to. Maybe actually it's a combination of several of these different factors. My point is my default response is not to assume that it is all part of God's plan. It could be any of these different things, right? But Jesus is risen from the dead. And in a sense, that's the more important thing for us to take hold of, rather than understanding where it's come from, but to know this reality. The gospel hope is not that everything that happens to you is the will of God. The gospel hope is that no matter what happens to you, God is with you, at your side, and the tomb is empty. So no matter what lies in your path, no matter what kind of evil you bump up against in your life, God is able to bring good out of that evil. I really can't talk about this without going to another well-known verse from Romans, which many of you will know and many of you will have been thinking or, or have quoted on occasion. That verse in Romans 8 that says, We know that in all things God works for the good. And please, if you're quoting that verse, don't ever stop there. That is not the end of the sentence. The verse does not say and the Bible does not promise that God works all things together for good. We need the whole of the verse. We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. Those who wake up morning by morning, offering themselves to Jesus as Lord and Saviour and Master and choosing to follow his ways and to seek after his kingdom and to offer to him all of their dreams and their hopes and their brokenness and their bad decisions and to say to him, lead me forward. For those people, God is able to work all things together for good. All the evil that you've run into, all of your mistakes, all of your sin and brokenness, all of those things that were not part of God's will, God can bring good out of all that evil. And just to be clear, this doesn't change the fact that evil is evil. Abuse is evil, even if God can bring something good out of it. Divorce, pain, death. Those things are evil, even if God can bring some good things out of them. But we worship a God who is able to take the evil we come up against, that was not his plan, not his heart, not his purpose for our lives, to break into that and to bring out something good. But here's the thing, in case you've heard this all before. When Paul says that God can work things together for good, I don't think he's talking about our happiness. I think if we look back to Philippians chapter 1, that Paul might define good as the advance of the gospel. When I think about God working for good, I think about how God can bring me happiness in my mess. But for Paul, it's about how God can work in our mess to advance the gospel. Keep in mind that this first chapter of Philippians is is basically Paul's answer to the question, how are you? And his answer is essentially, what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Because of this, I rejoice. So what do we do when evil comes along? I want to suggest that we don't blame God and we don't jump straight to this idea that it was part of God's plan. But instead, we partner with God to seek the advance of the gospel. 
And so as we finish, I just want to invite us to think, what has happened to you? We've heard a bit of what happened to Paul. What is it that has happened to you? What's the difficulty, the evil that you have bumped up against or, or are up against right now? How is it that God might take that and use it somehow to advance the gospel? And therefore, what is it you might choose to rejoice in this week? What's happened to you that God might take that and use it to advance the gospel so that we too might rejoice? When our lives are bound up in the gospel of Jesus, that's when we really get to know what joy is about. When our answer to the question, how are you, is the same as our answer to the question, how is the gospel? Then we can be filled with joy, just as Paul is. I want us to just hold a few moments of quiet as we, we think about how this lands for us. So Father, as we just sit quietly a moment now, would you help us to, to just to see how you are at work in the things that we've bumped up against? 